Hello, my name is Joan Capurro, and I sit on the Board of Directors of the Marine History Museum, and I'm here with Marcy Miller today. And we want to welcome you. You're coming into a segment of everyday items in the early days. As you can see, I don't expect many of you to remember those. I want to tell you a little bit about Marcy. Marcy is our volunteer program director and a very dedicated woman to the museum. Marcy runs a traveling trunk school program in Marin where she introduces over 450 children a year to Marin's history. And I understand you make your own outfits for each one of those trips. And she takes artifacts and artifacts so young people can learn about history. You've probably seen her in our historic walking tours series throughout Marin. Marcy uh, arranges lecture series for Marin history at the Elks Club. And thank you, Elks Club. You have been a great supporter to the Marin History Museum, and thanks to you, you are an elk also. So, um, Marcy, first of all, how long have you been an elk? Two years. Two years, okay. So, we have some really interesting items here, and you start, and I'll just kind of chime in when I can. Well, thank you, Joan. This yeah. is going to be really fun. I love looking at old things. Mm. You know, life hasn't changed. We still eat bread, we still <laughs> make sausage, yeah, right. we still type letters, iron our clothes, wash our clothes, but how we did it in the 1800s in early Marin was much different. Yes. It was a chore. It was mom's full-time job to just do that. So we're gonna look at some of these things and talk about them and imagine and be grateful that we don't have to do it and you're gonna the old do way it anymore. And you're gonna do it first person, right? This is. Like you're the woman and this is what you yes. use. Like I love yes. that. Yes, you're coming into my home <laughs> yes. and I'm going to tell you how I made some food for us. <laughs> I wish we could make some food uh, in the old days. Don't quite have the recipes. The recipes are quite interesting from the old days. My, one of the very first talks I did was to a uh, gardening group from Marin County and they came to the Boyd Gate House. And I did my first preparation to talk to them about gardening and I was going to cover the um, Victorian gardens of Ola and Polly, that was the Burdell family, mm. one of the first right. families in Marin County. And in the, our collection here, we have uh, Mary Burdell's cookbook. Oh. <laughs> and she makes mincemeat. And I've never eaten mincemeat. But it calls for a few ingredients and then a cup of brandy. It's my favorite pie. And a few more ingredients and some whiskey. And then it had some port wine. And it had a, a lot of liquor in it. She was replaced by Julia Childs, by uh, the way. Probably. <laughs> but the recipes are interesting. They included only um, ingredients that you probably grew on your land. Right. We didn't go to the grocery store. You went to probably a meat market. You went to the dairy. Probably you would, you would know a dairy farmer and get your dairy products from right. him. But they didn't have a Whole Foods or a grocery store like we think of it. Didn't even have a farmer's market like we know. No. So you went out in your backyard and you got the things you ate. Right. So those items were quite different than the um, type of things we'll find on our plate today because they come from all over the world now. Right. I don't think Mary Burdell ever saw an artichoke. No, and no I, I never saw an artichoke. And I doubt if she peeled a shrimp. Until I was 17. But something that she did do in um, the early days was make sausage. Oh. Now, that's I'm going to show this sausage maker. They would, of course, you, you use the part of the uh, animal that was the lining of the um, intestines and you would clean that and it was very elastic and, and kind of spandex-ish. Right. And it made a long tube, as we can picture what intestines would look like. And you would take your meat and you would put it into this hole. This is a very specialized device. You would put your casing on here and you would push the meat through and the casing would come out and you would tie it off. And you could make beef sausage or pork sausage or any type of um, meats that you wanted to put into a sleeve. So you, you put the sleeve on the outside? Mm -hmm. Okay. It would fit on there, you would push this through, and it would take, this holds about four cups here, so it would take a long time to make it. it this wouldn't be something you would do every morning. It would be like one day we're making sausage, mm -hmm. and you'd make sausage all day, and probably put it in a smokehouse out in the back. All the homes in those days had outbuildings. You'd have one that had constant right. and a little bit of smoke being made. you smoke all your meats to preserve it. In the 1800s, we certainly didn't have refrigeration. No. We didn't even have ice boxes here, really, because there wasn't a place to get a big block of ice. In the Midwest, up north, you could bring down blocks of ice and put them into an ice box. 
that uh, was used in the day. But, that but was the they early, didn't have them then. That was the early 1800s, right? Because I remember even in the 50s where you had big uh, blocks of ice for your refrigerators. Mm -hmm. Well, then you had so, more transportation than trains. Right. I'm talking before the train came. Yeah, I know. And that ice box, if it was on the covered wagon when it came west, we'll say with James Miller, it didn't make it over the Rockies. No. It got sacrificed on the way. That's why they have all those antiques in the Midwest. So it was hard for you to make that sausage, So this was right? one device. Even <laughs> owning this to, to do it for yourself, they bought these items probably through the catalog sales. Um, the first uh, catalog sales company was Sears and Roebuck. Right. And you buy all your home items. You can even buy a house in a box through, through them. <laughs> Here's another item I probably would have used before I got to that oh. uh, machine. This was the meat grinder. Right. You'd put the meat in here. It has a very sharp blade on the inside, probably could break up bones and all kinds of things. And then the meat would come out here in, in what would be like what we're familiar with looking at ground beef hamburger. Right. We had one of those, but it looked a little better than that does. This, <laughs> cranking this all day. I think the only thing worse than cranking this would be cranking that sleeve that made ice cream. What do you suppose this is for? This mounted it onto a, uh, the bench. Oh, yeah, I got you. Oh, this right. would go in there. Have you ever used one of those, Marcy? I remember having yeah, one of those, but too. mine was attached to a Cuisinart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I don't remember that. Um, I think I have seen them because my mother collected old uh, mm -hmm. items like this and just had one and we could think about that. Here would be a scale. Now the scale might have been more used in the uh, local... Um, butcher shops? In the but butcher yeah. shops or in the um, mer mercantile stores where they would have to weigh out a bulk of something. Might weigh out a bag of flour, things like that. They're not incredibly accurate. This has got a, the label of Vogue on it, family scale. So you could weigh anything. You might want to you know, weigh out a certain amount of apples. If you were canning and doing things at home, you might want to have a weight on them so that you could sell it and have put some value to it that way. I have weights now. But there's, we have quite a collection of scales. So it must have been a common item to have in the homes. Otherwise, why are there so many still available? All for different purposes, different sizes of uh, container on the top. This right. is a very flat one. I can't imagine you weighed too much. I wouldn't. No. They didn't weigh off. But there were more farms. Yes, you know, to weigh all smaller, different kinds right. of things. They might even have weighed the piglets and the chickens and the eggs on it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there, it looks like there's a dish missing from that. You think so? Or maybe a pan goes on that. But I love the Definitely fact that... Definitely has a screw on it that doesn't belong It's there. called Vogue, which is very strange. These items are all so popular when I go out to the schools. Let's see what that Children says. just love to see how things uh, work. It says went. family scale on it. Vogue, Vogue. family scale. Isn't that something? That's amazing. I wish we knew the prices of these items. Another scale that we have in the back is a, a scale to weigh yourself. And that was an item that we don't have any records or any history of, but you could put a dime in it or a penny maybe, see how much you weighed. At one time, we had traveling museum that would go out to shopping centers. And oh, we had an exhibit yeah. at the Northgate Shopping Center before it was a closed-in mall. Oh, yeah. And so we had these outside cases. And I think when we packed everything up, I think the Emporium was there then, they right. said, oh, here's our chance to clean out the basement. And they gave us all this stuff. Oh and gosh. one of them was the scales. And I remember seeing them in Woolworths. And they had the glass mirror on the front. Right. It's, it's very I interesting. Mean, I remember it's that. Back right. there. We, have a back, we have a lot of so good things So maybe we should there. pull that out and everybody here should have to weigh themselves. Did I go back to this one more time to tell you something yeah. I read on the bottom? It says, new legal, right? New right. legal use and trade. It says family, but it's new legal use in trade. It says not legal for use in trade. Like I said, new legal. <laughs> so, so this could not have been used for commercial use. It had to be family. Use, so okay. It had to be in the home. That's I've never seen but one like that. It doesn't like mean that. you weren't weighing and packaging jelly and eggs and stuff to sell t to the neighbors. You right. just couldn't put it down for sale right. in, a, in a licensed store. Very interesting. Another thing that went on in the day. Well, Dad made the shoes probably for all the kids, <laughs> and there's lots of different implements this way. Let me get some things out of the way so right. we can see them a little better. Okay. So you'd have different kinds of shoes, different width of the um, of what went on here. But you'd put the cow hides. We split the hides, and you'll often hear of, of cow hide being called a split hide. They would use a full hide for the sole of the shoe. You might use the split hides for the side. But you could wet mm. that hide, pound it on here, mold it into a shape, use a dowel, poke holes so that you could thread the seams on the side. And you could have, there's a small size here. Oh, that's what that is. This one right. has one for maybe for a longer boot to be down the side. Mm. So you could put that shoe piece on here and stitch it to lace it. 
Now this was before any of the fancy shoes that had the right. buttons and the hooks. This was just totally lacing. Probably just cut a hole in the leather. They didn't uh, put the metal eye in or anything Don't that way. Don't you think the size is interesting? It seems like there were smaller feet years ago. These might have been for children. Uh -huh. um, and of course, you know, they, the shoes, shoes graduated too. down the family. Now that's very interesting. So one's supposed to be for an adult? Oh no, one's for boots and Could one's for, yeah. Yes, for smaller size shoe. Because you'd wet, the, you'd wet the leather until it dried hard. Oh. <laughs> Have you made shoes before, Marcy? <laughs> I've worked on leather. Here, I'll move that down to the table. Oh, you can take it down. Okay. It's totally out of the way. Sorry for that noise. And some other items in the house that I find um, interesting are uh, irons. Now, we yes. you find lots of irons. There's lots of irons available. You'll find them in garage sales. You'll find them everywhere. Why are there just so many? Every house has one for a doorstop. Right. I grew up with them at yeah, doorstop. Right. I have that. several here. They graduated over the years on, on how they were designed. Different purposes, different uh, sizes to get into collars. Now, if we think about clothes in the Victorian days, or the 18, in the 18, late 1800s, right. um, I don't think they did that much laundry. Uh, you made the clothes so they weren't worn that much. Women's clothes were much different. Women's yes. dresses, as we can picture a woman's dress, was quite long and it dragged on the ground. Underneath that dress was a, a type of slip that could be replaced, and it had about a four-inch band all around the skirt that was made of horse hair, and it was very thick. That's what dragged on the ground. So if that got okay. dirty, you would just take out that little undercoat and get rid of it so that the top silk fabric, or organza, wouldn't get worn away. Have you ever made an outfit like that? Because I know you make some of the old costumes. Yeah, I made you this have? one. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, so that's how they preserve their clothes. Earlier than that, Victorians were very, f um, really liked having little monkeys. Monkeys? Little monkeys, the little spider monkeys. And they'd carry them on their shoulders, and the little monkeys used to pick out the nits and the fleas and the little ticks and stuff out of the fabric oh, how of gross. their clothes. <laughs> but you'd think I have my pet monkey, but actually it's picking off the bugs out of my clothes. Because they didn't wash the clothes that often, it was hard. Yeah, those clothes were right. made, uh, incredible uh, fabrication into making those clothes. But if we ever heard the line, putting all your irons in the fire. Yes. Do you know what that means? No. But you've heard it? Yes. When you would heat up one of these irons in the coals, Don't touch that. to get them hot, and this one has a wood handle, this one had a leather handle on it, but the leather's gone and now it's metal because you wouldn't want to put, burn your hand. They all had covers on right. them like that. And I'm sure lots of women got burned regardless of protection that they used on them. But as long as it took, for the amount of time it took to heat this, Say it took a half hour to get this good and hot so I can iron my linen shirt right. that I've washed. And we'll show so a a washing procedure. If it took 30 minutes to get hot, and I bet it took longer, it cooled off in half that time. In 15 minutes, this would be cold. And I probably didn't finish my garment. So I'd have another one in the fire. Right. So I would have lots of irons in the fire to get the ironing done. So you have five irons out right here. here and they're really quite different. But it could, they always, this is a six, that's a five. They had different purposes. They had different uh, treatments on the bottom to keep them. I'm thinking um, that large one over there, Marcy, must be for ironing, like, if you will, jeans kind of material, because I could hardly pick that up. Do you seriously think Mom ironed Dad's jeans? Yeah, I do. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Dad took them off. Um, oh. This one's cast iron. It could have been um, used for um, doing canvas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It could have been used by a boat right. It could have been used for anything. A lot of times when they're heavy like this, they're used more to make that crease permanent and just oh. see, see that, sure, that makes sense. So you might go like that. You might have been doing, maybe, maybe you're making the right. cover over your wagon because mm -hmm. it ripped. And today we have steam for those creases, but that would do it. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the idea that I wanted to get across was that you had lots of irons in the fire. Four or five and irons. And that, that meant, you know, if you didn't have enough irons in your fire, you probably weren't going to get the ironing done for that day. And this is another thing that took all day. There'd be one day that'd just be right. laundry day. I can even ironing. remember that for my mom in the yeah. 50s. I do. You know, irons in the fire, they, they use that at work also. Well, Too it also much means, going on. It, it, also, <laughs> it goes with being prepared, right. planning ahead. Those type of things. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So one of the hardest things, and I will stand up for this okay. one. Okay. This is the one. This is what the kids get the most kick out of. Um, let me take this down first. Okay. This would be your laundry bucket. Now you could use this for agitating the clothes on the front here. 
might take this out to the creek and put it over the rocks in the river and uh, you would soak this up. They made smaller ones that were traveling ones that we have some here at the museum it's that people carried wood. in their suitcase so that they could wash their dainties at the right, hotel as right. they traveled across the country coming out west because they were sure there'd be laundry services here. I remember some that so weren't made out of wood. There were ones not made out of board. This one's probably pretty old. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Then they came along with being able to wash their laundry in a pan like this. And this is the agitator. It's like a, Amazing. almost like a toilet plunger. Right, it looked like metal. it. But the water would go up there and, it would, and you could agitate like this, washing these clothes, stomping it like this. And it probably took a long time because clothes were not, fabrics were not thin. They were no. very heavy then. That's right. So after you did this, you would have this contraption. This is what you would wring the water out of and it goes, this, the clothes go through here. I'm using a piece of paper so it's not quite thick enough to get it. But this was used by the um, Switzer family in Novato uh -huh. when they first came. This has mounting holes so it would have mounted onto the device. But that is how you wrung the water out of your clothes eventually. And of course your clothes is all going to have all these bumps in it and everything and then you're going to need to have lots of irons in the fire right. to get those wrinkles iron, ironed out of there. But Boy. I got to tell you that... Um, they have it easy today. <laughs> yes. Can you imagine doing this? No, I can't. So, and it's made out of wood. That's really interesting to me. Yes, it is. And it's, it's got some little rot on it, too. So it's not <laughs> holding up all that Pretty long. old. So after a while, we got civilized out here in Marin. This is civilized. William Coleman decided that we needed a courthouse and needed to take care of business. Uh -huh. Prior to that, we were holding court and taking care of legal businesses. Um, at Timothy Murphy's old adobe oh, right. at the corner of C and 4th Street where there's a pool hall now, mm -hmm. kind of fits. Timothy Murphy was the first non-Spanish resident in San Rafael. Oh, and he nice um, communicated with the uh, Miwok Indians and with the mission and the uh, first people that are settling here and looked out for them and made sure they had their rights taken care of. He did a, a pretty good job. As a reward for all his work, he was granted the Rancho uh, Santa Margarita, all the way out to Point San Pedro, That's all the way nice. to Red Hill in San Samuel. He owned a lot of land. I think he got a good deal taking care of the Indians. But um, after a while, story. that adobe turned into what they called a mud pile. And William Coleman came along and said, we need a courthouse. So he funded the bonds, and they built the courthouse that we hopefully all remember on 4th Street as oh, the courthouse yes. for the county. Oh, yes. I, in fact, my husband and I the bought county uh, got our uh, marriage license there. San Rafael was the county seat. Yeah. Um, James Miller, who was the first settler who came to Marin County and got his wagons all the way over the Rockies. A mm. lot of people may have got here before him, but they didn't make it here with their wagons. Mm. He did. He's a very um, well-known um, right. figure in Marin County I history. Settled Marinwood. Um, managed the estate from, William, from Timothy Murphy after he died. Established St. Vincent's School for Boys. Oh, it's wonderful. He also, formed, he also built the Dixie School. He also, on his way out here, built these little houses up in the mountains that the family had to stay in before they came down into Sutter's uh, Fort. Little cabins. Um, three years later, those little cabins were um, used by the Donner family. Oh. So wow. William James Miller built the first condos up in the Very church. interesting. You did live in those days. You I have a did, lot of information. <laughs> he also, coming um, across the Humboldt um, sink and didn't have any water, met an Indian who led him to a creek up in, um, in the Tahoe area. And that he was very grateful to that chief showing him water. And he named that creek for that Indian. And his name was Chief Truckee. No, so Truckee. R. James Miller named the Truckee River, too. Oh, my. But that after, interesting. so that's what, that's what these people um, worked with on their home. They had to make their own sausage, preserve their own meat, put it into, the meat had to get into some source that was able to be smoked. You couldn't just put a slab of meat out on no, the wood. No, no. Um, you, you made your own shoes. You cleaned your own clothes. You went through all of this. You, you had to weigh the flour to make the bread. But after a while, you decided you wanted to get a job. So you went down and you worked at the San Rafael Courthouse. And this was the typewriter you typed on. This typewriter is from 1892. That's amazing. It was used in the San Rafael Courthouse there at Marin County, the Marin County Courthouse. Don't mix it up with San Rafael. You know, James Miller's son, William Miller, wanted the county seat to be out in Nicasio. And that's why he built a square out there, the shape it was, in preparation for a big courthouse to be built. Oh 
But they had an election, and I think San Rafael won it by 60 votes. <laughs> so the county seat became San smart. Rafael. But this typewriter is just really incredible. It's missing a couple of parts because it's uh, not really uh, transportable. It's missing the return keys. Right. But it, uh, it types yeah, so down here right. below. It's so the most, it's a, a job, great sound. So you might be, yeah, the old typewriters. I remember these old typewriters. I had one like this. So they, you know, the way you we had type, one like that. Well, it had keys, and it, and it <laughs> had the ribbon on it with the two spills, and you get it all over your fingers. And yes. It didn't have liftoffs, and you couldn't erase, Ready. and it was just a. That that's amazing, though. Disaster. I mean, maybe there, that's why I'm not a typist. And well, we have several typewriters that are real different, but this mm -hmm. looked like it was the oldest one. It has this little bell on it too. It has a bell. Ding. Yeah, oh yes, I remember when they used to have those. So another thing like that, that was really big in San Rafael, and you have it in front right. of you, is the Marin IJ. Yes, yes. I I just I'll let you talk about it, but I just want to say one thing. When I opened this up, what really struck me was this little. There's a little ad in here. It says Hotel Raphael, American and European plans, dinner one dollar and fifty cent per person. <laughs> This so was, I was, it was an elaborate, I mean, my extensive type of hotel located in the Dominican. That's what old newspapers look like. Newspapers only came out once a week in those days. Right. It was called the Marin Journal, San Rafael, California. It went through several different names, managed by Mr. Wilkins. It was called the Toscan then. It was the Marin Journal. It was the I Independent Journal. The Marin Independent Journal. And what's our oldest uh, Toscan, book? Toscan, I think. Uh, at oh, 18? 1861? Yeah, 1861. The one. And the old ones are very fragile, but they can still be looked at. We wear white gloves to protect the papers on them. Yes. We're so These fortunate. Jeff Kramer, who this building right. is, is uh, dedicated to, the Kramer family, um, mm -hmm. family owned the IJ. And during his course of still volunteering for us, became this collection of the IJs that we have all around us here. Um, Sure, you can look at the IJ on Microfish, and you can, it's being right. digitalized in the future, and newspapers are going that way. But, Jonas, just as you were looking and seeing that ad, oh. there's nothing like looking at an old newspaper. Right. And um, I, I can't look at one page. I have to look at the page before and the page after. Uh, let me tell you a story of an article I found, you know, a, a common, di not common, a terrible disease that people had was consumption, which is tuberculosis. Right. And uh, they had, there's an ad in one of the papers here that, claims that this uh, liquid, elixir, if you fed it to your children, they would be cured in four doses. <laughs> I mean, wow, what a story. But it is, it is to read the dialect and what was important and what made the paper. There's always shootings and barroom fights and things like that was, was uh, what made the paper. And well, there were a lot of bars. And Lo a lot of bars in Marin. Lots of bars. Uh, but <laughs> life in the day was hard. It took all day to do it. Yes. Everything that we do now had to be done then. You had to eat, you had to sleep. That's right. Had to be safe, had to have a home. The roof didn't leak. Yet things were simpler in ways. Yes. <laughs> okay. Am I right? Okay. <laughs> I mean, it was hard work, but, but life was simpler. So uh, that's what's so exciting about coming out here to the collections, is to see all this information. I think and people can make an appointment to talk with you, too, oh, about absolutely. things. And absolutely. Jocelyn and... Um, uh, Our librarian is the best. Yes, she, she's really good. She doesn't have to go look something up. She can just tell you. If you're interested in trains, we have everything mm -hmm. on trains. If you're interested in photography, we have old cameras. If you're interested in sewing, we have old sewing machines. We Weaving, have, all kinds of stuff. We have old everything. We even have signs about bank robberies, which were very, I found to yes. be really interesting. So I, and I just want to, as we close up here, I really want to encourage people to join the Marin History Museum to become a member at a hundred dollar level because it gives you so much. We are um, associated with NARM, National Association of Reciprocal Museums. Yes, reciprocal. That was the word. <laughs> at the hundred dollar level, yeah. as a Marin History Museum member, you can also go to over seven hundred museums through the Smithsonian for free. Right. I've used I've used it for six different people, family members, to go to the Disney Museum over in the Presidio, and it is absolutely beautiful. And I could go back three more times before I could see the whole <laughs> thing. But as you walk out, they talk about how Walt Disney died at a young age, in 65, and I don't think I've ever gotten out of there without crying. But it's but there's so much pleasure in history and information. So anyway, we are working really hard. Our nine-member board of directors to preserve our directors and you particularly as our program director 
to preserve these artifacts and these pictures. So please, um, if you have too much, send it to us and we're happy to take care of it for you. And I'm talking about your money. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very so much you. for um, oh. for what you've done today and how this you've told pleasure, us all. John. I love it that you are like <laughs> like you lived in those days and you know so much. I love it, <laughs> and I want to thank also uh, Ed Dukowski. I never say Ed's name right. I absolutely love him and his team who are doing this to Great support team. the History Museum to keep us going and. Uh, most importantly, people don't know about this. There's a lot of people that don't know what goes on here. Or they don't know that we're at the Boyd Museum and where that is at 1125 B, uh, D Street. This is the Marin History Street, for Marin like. residents. That's right. It's, your, it's Marin All residents' Marin. history and we're holding on to it. Come and yeah. see us and yeah. support us. That's right. That's right. And we'll do, we'll do more of these little educational tours, I hope. I learn something every time. So thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Joan. And thank you, team. <laughs>